the topic is taken from Matthew 5 13. You are the salt of the earth. Father, we thank you so much that you deemed us capable to play the role you expect from us. We thank you, Father, that on this earth, in this world, you expect us to carry out certain things that will promote the kingdom. We are blessed indeed. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will keep equipping us, encouraging us, building us up for us to play the role expected from us. Come, Holy Spirit, in our midst. Open our minds and our spirits to the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the truth of your word, to know the way, the truth, and the life that will lead us to you. Come, Holy Spirit, take control of everything. Seize our mind, take our minds captive. Even though there's a lot of noise outside, this place is a holy ground where you are going to show your power and you are going to build us to make us spiritually strong till we finish this Lenten period. Come, Holy Spirit, and take control. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we are praying. Amen. Brethren, like I said, today's topic is taken from Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth. And we have Pastor Frankisi to do justice to this topic and show us how we can play our role as salt on the earth. Thank you very much. The peace of the Lord be with you. I trust we are all doing well. And how is the Lenten season going? So far, so good all. Hallelujah. Today is the 13, right? And the theme that has been selected for our reflection this afternoon is you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. And the text is from Matthew chapter 5, the verse 13. Let us listen to the word of God. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we have gathered together to listen from you. We pray in the name of Jesus, asking that you give us clear understanding of your word. And we also ask that you grant us the grace to be able to put your word to a good practice. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the text which I just read, Matthew chapter 5, the verse 13, where we picked our theme from. In this particular text, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ compares his disciples with salt. So during Jesus' time, he was making reference to his disciples. But today, it is us here. 
that the Lord is speaking to us. And he's saying to you and I that we are the salt of the earth. These days, salt has become so common that it is very easy to forget how valuable salt has been in history. So in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there are a number of references that points to the use of salt. For instance, in Leviticus chapter 2, the verse 13, it reads, And every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. So this is a command from the Lord. That your grain offering must be seasoned with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Again, in 2 Kings chapter 2, the verses 19 to 21, we are told that at a point in time, A group of people complained to Elisha and they said that the water that they had was so bad they could not drink from it and it would not cause their crops also to yield the desired produce. So the prophet said to them that bring me a bowl of salt. They brought it to him, he poured it and the water became fresh. Bible says life came into that water. In Jesus' time, when he made this statement, you are the salt of the earth. Salt was also seen as a valuable commodity. And even in that dispensation, it served various purposes. Interestingly, there were some Roman soldiers during the days of Jesus who were paid with quantities of salt. Can you imagine? Today when they give you salt as your, your monthly salary, you would get angry. But in those days, people were paid with quantities of, of salt. So for working for an entire month, that is what you receive home. Because of the various purposes that it served. In fact, the Latin word for salt is actually sol, S-A-L. And when salt became a means of, 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 of paying Roman soldiers, or it became a means through which wages were paid, they had the word salarium. Salarium. I've said that sol, S-A-L, is a Latin word for salt. And once it was used in paying wages, it became known as salarium. And if you study it carefully, you would notice that the English word salary is actually coming from this word salarium. So I'm saying to the fact that salt was such an important commodity in the days of old. And what we call salary today is actually derived from the root word sol, which means salt, because at one point in time, it was used to pay people. In our reflection for today, we are looking at what it means to be the salt of the earth. So as I was going through, I was asking, why did Jesus not say sugar? Because sugar is sweet. <laughs> but why salt and not sugar? So what does it mean to be the salt of the earth? So salt is used as a preservative. It can be used as a preservative agent. So when you have food, when you have meat and you want to ensure that it doesn't decay or you want to ensure that you don't experience any spoilage 
most especially with meat and fish and animal product, you may want to apply salt to it. So salt is an agent that can be used to preserve food. A missionary by name David Livingston, he is actually from, he's, he, he was a Scottish missionary and he belonged to the London Missionary Society. So David Livingston was brought to Southern Africa and he worked in places like Zambia and Malawi. At a point in time, after spending over 30 years, he spent 60 years, so more than half of his years were spent on African soil. When he passed on, it was requested that his body would be sent to Westminster Abbey in England to be buried. And at that time, they had to embalm him with salt. And it took almost about nine months before the, the body got to England to be buried. And they, they, they embalmed him with salt. So aside food, you know, aside food and meat, we have also seen a missionary, David Livingston, who was embalmed with salt. And his body was intact and he was sent to Westminster Abbey in England to be buried. It is an agent that can be used to preserve food items. From the expression, you are the salt of the earth, it is clear from this metaphor that Christians or believers are the salt. So he spoke to his disciples at the time and today he's speaking to us. So he says you are the salt of the earth. So the believers, Christians, are the salt. And one thing about salt is that it is not subject to decay. So what he was saying is that you have a role to play in ensuring that the world does not become corrupt. The earth or the world or unbelievers like food so meat and fish is subject to decay, corruption, and spoilage. And you would agree with me that the world has been experiencing decay since the fall, as recorded in Genesis chapter 3. And interestingly, it is not getting better, even though we are praying a lot. So, in this particular expression, you are the salt of the earth, there are two things he presents to us. That the believers, Christians, are those that can be referred to as the salt. And the word world used in this sense refers to the unbelievers, which can also be likened to meat and fish that is subject to decay. So, in a nutshell, he's saying that Christians and unbelievers have different natures. You are the salt of the earth. You as a believer and the unbeliever are not the same. You have different natures. So, that is why one experiences decay. So, the world, that can be compared to food meat, fish. It experiences decay. But you, the believer, the Christian, you don't experience any decay. So the first truth that we have learned is that it is used as a preservative. Salt can be used as a flavoring agent. It gives flavor to food. And I recall some years ago, I was in Fiji. Uh, Captain, you've been there before. You have done about 150. <laughs> you know Fiji. <laughs> it's very far. It takes you almost like two days to hit the place. And you do about three or four transits before you hit the place. 
And I was there with some Nigerian friends and some friends from um, Zambia and Malawi. And anytime we went for dining, even before tasting the food, they would start asking for salt. And I used to pick the salt and hide it. <laughs> then they would come begging for the salt. I said, well, this your food is not tasty, and we need salt to make it tasty. Then I'll tell them that too much of salt is also not good for, for you because it has an impact on your medical science to tell us your pressure reduce the intake of salt, most especially if the food has been cooked and you are now applying it to it. But then they will tell me, a little salt will make its presence felt. A little salt will make its presence felt. In other words, you are saying, we, we are not going to pour a lot, just a little, and we'll still get that kind of flavor. We'll still get the good taste that we want to experience. So for us as Christians, we have been called to bring flavor and riches to the world around us. And just as salt does to food, in the same way the Lord says to us that you are a flavoring agent and you must bring taste, you must bring flavor, you must bring richness to the world around you. Again, salt also brings healing and restoration. So, in ancient times, once someone gets a sore, though they drop quantities of salt in water, and they would wash or dress your wound with the salt solution, which aided in your healing and also brought some restoration. Number four, you would also notice that when you consume a lot of salt, you, you get thirsty. When you take a lot of salt, you need a lot of, you need a lot of water. And here the Lord is saying that we are the people that, that must lead others to Christ. Let us recall the encounter between Jesus and and the Samaritan woman, when you read John chapter 4, when Jesus asked for water, the woman said, Ah, but I'm a Samaritan, you are a Jew. We have no relationship. Why do you come to me asking for water? Then Jesus said to him, you, you got it all wrong. You see, this water that you are even carrying, when you drink it, you get thirsty again. But I have a water that when you drink, you will not test. It is, able to, it is able to quench your test. It is so refreshing that when you take this water, you don't need any other water again. And the woman said, how oh, is that possible? If there is a water that is so satisfying, so refreshing, that once you take, you don't need any other water, then I introduce, I introduce me to that water. I want to know that water. So here he's saying that you are the salt of the earth. When you come into contact with people, when people experience you, they must desire for water. In other words, your very being, your very presence, who you are, must be able to lead people to Christ Jesus, who is the living water, who is able to quench our test. So how do we become salt of the earth? And I'm saying that for salt to, to become very effective, we must know these things. We must have some contact with the world. So for so to be effective, for the believer or the Christian to be effective, you must have a contact. You must have a relationship with the world. 
So before salt can serve as a preservative or give flavor or bring that soothing relief or would cause people to, to test for water. If it has to do with the food or the meat and we want to preserve it, then consciously we must apply the salt to it. So until you apply the salt to the food, until you apply the salt to the meat or to that fish, it cannot preserve it. And if you need that flavor, you know, my friends will say a little salt will make its presence felt. Until that little salt that will make its presence felt is introduced into the food, the food will still taste, will, will, will be tasteless. We will not get that desired flavor. And if our wounds will heal, then we must drop those quantities of salt in water and, and, and clean that soil with it. So I'm saying that for us as Christians, for us as believers, if we would make significant impact in this world, we must be involved in our day-to-day -day acti activities. We must have a contact with unbelievers. Or we must have a contact with the world. So we don't shy away from them. But we must participate in all that is necessary. So, for instance, when you read Matthew chapter 11, the verse 19, it says that the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, here is a gluten and a drunkard. One, a friend of tax collectors. And in those days, tax collectors were seen as as, as evil people, you know, as people that did things that opposed the will of God. Because normally they would add their commission to whatever tax has been prescribed. And the difference goes to them. And so they were not liked by many people. And so to, 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 to apply that trade or to be in that business, you would be seen as an evil person. And here it says that here is a gluten and a drunkard, one who is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So these are the people that Jesus moved with. Or these are the people that Jesus had contact with. He came for the sick. Those that had problems. Those that had issues. Those that had relationship problems with the Lord. Those are the people that he got into contact with so that he would be able to impact their lives so that he would be able to affect their lives so even though he moved with sinners he moved with tax collectors he moved with the prostitute he moved with people that were branded and seen as evil and having deviated from the path of god he was never corrupted by their practices so when you read Hebrews chapter 7, the verse 26, it says that such a high priest truly meets our need. So he's talking about Jesus, who is our high priest in Hebrews chapter 7. And it goes on to say that one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, ex exalted above the heavens. Yes, yeah, so he had contact with the world. He had contact with those that had, had, had deviated from the ways of the Lord. But he ensured that the very things that they did that opposed the will of God, he would not be seen in those things. Yes, yeah, so we can draw closer to such people that have missed the mark, but will not engage or will not participate in their evil doings. I am saying that for the meat or the food to be preserved, we must apply the salt. For the food to receive that good taste, we must apply the salt. For, for, for that person to experience that test, that person must take in something that is salty. For that wound to heal quickly, we must drop 
quantities of salt in that water. And I'm saying that the world that is decaying, we must get closer to this world. When we were on campus seminary, there used to be a colleague of us. So, you know, TTS is at uh, Mimpasem. And if you know Mimpasem and um, East Legon, it's not too far. So, we had a colleague of us who had a ministry. He carried a special grace. And this grace was ministering to the prostitutes. If you know the Lagos Avenue, it's not too far from, so some few minutes from East Legon, you hit TTS. And he used to. <laughs> See his face. <laughs> so, he used to come to Lagos Avenue and all those areas in the night, and he comes to minister to to the prostitutes there, you know. And one day he was almost beaten up because he spoke to one of the prostitutes, led this lady to Christ and promised to help the lady, you know. But you know, as a student, the, the support wasn't forthcoming. You know, for these prostitutes, they have seen money or they see money. So <laughs> once you cannot meet the person's, you know, expectations, they will go back to it. So one time he went back and saw this lady. He said, ah, you are here again. But I thought we had closed chapter on this deal a long time ago. Having accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. And for all the assurances that I have given to you, why would you come here again? He says, I, I must survive now. Then he mentioned that the lady said to me, Pastor, pray for me so that today I'll get good deals. <laughs> Then he said, I won't pray for you, but I'm praying that God would, God would deny you access to people. Then he says that before he can, I mean, he, he, he would even notice this girl had come to slap him. That God should curse that your mouth that you are praying against me. Look at me. I don't have money. I've come to I have come to work and I'm, I'm asking you to pray so that God would bring people my way. You are telling me that you are also praying against me. He says it wasn't easy. You know. But I'm saying that there are people that must be witness to. There are people that we must reach. See, for these people, they won't listen to the preachings on radio. For these people, they will not tend to to, to the television to watch a minister preach, you know, they will not read things that has to do with the gospel. For them, they have their interest and in things that excite them. So when it comes to listening to a message on radio, um, a preaching on television, or going to the internet to soak, I mean, a godly message, they will not do it. And so somebody must visit such people. Somebody must go to these people and preach or witness to them. How would they hear about the message of Christ if we don't send a message to them? So there are times that we chastise them and we lambast them and we say all sorts of things. But there is a gap. There is a gap. Until the shout would be effective, it must be robbed. On something. And we had that contact with these people. Bear in mind that I have said that the contact does not mean go and practice what they did because I've quoted Matthew and I've quoted uh, um, um, Hebrews looking at Jesus' Jesus's example. Even though he was a friend of the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes, Hebrews will tell you that. He was blameless, he was pure, he was set apart from sinners. So you realize that we are not making maybe significant impact because the contact has been minimal. The contact has been minimal. So until we establish contact, then we cannot make good progress. So we can establish this contact 
One, when we share the gospel. Yes, so proclaim the gospel to those that you love. Those that have deviated from the path of the Lord. And you can tell that they're on their path to destruction. You don't need to look far. Sometimes just look within the family. You may have a spouse. You may have a sibling. You may have a son or a daughter. What have you done? Have you prayed for that person? Have you shared the message of salvation with that person? Have you given up on that person? We don't need to give up on those people. Those that we want to impact. We must proclaim the word. We must share the word. We must tell them about the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Until we do that, we cannot make impact. Those that we find in, in our workplaces, have we taken time to tell them about the good news. So we can discuss all manner of things from politics to but we barely talk about things of God. So we go did you watch the Premier League? Did you watch this soup? Have you heard what the president has said? Have you heard what this minister has done? Those are the things we will talk. And nobody would want to talk about. Were you in church this Sunday? Have you prayed for that brother or sister who is going? The things about our faith, we relegate it to the background. But I'm saying that we must have that contact. That contact has to do with the fact that, one, we must share the gospel. If we really want to become the salt of the world, then we must be intentional about it. We must be intentional about it. We must be intentional about it. Until we tell others about Christ Jesus, our impact will be minimal. Our impact will be minimal. Two, I'm talking about lifestyle. So it is not just only professing Christ, telling others about Christ Jesus, but our lifestyle, what we stand for must also minister to others. We must radiate Christ so that when someone sees you, the person must see Christ in you. So in Antioch, they were called Christians because people could look at them and they could see the Christ-like qualities in the lives of the disciples. So when someone looks at you, will the person find Christ in you? Will the person find Christ in you? So we must live lives of integrity and honesty. And we must be faithful stewards of resources. And we must conduct ourselves with transparency and accountability. So in our homes, in our workplaces, in our community, would people see these positive, these good, these Christ-like qualities in our lives. A story is said of of an unbelieving boss or a boss who was an unbeliever and a subordinate who was a believer. And the boss had given an express instruction that A, B, C would come and look for me. When the, when the person comes, say to that person that I'm not there, you know. So A, B, C comes and the young lady says to ABC, my, my boss says I should tell you that <laughs> I, I am not there. She, she cannot lie, you know. She cannot lie because you are there, you know, but she, she won't compromise on, <laughs> on her faith. And so she would say, my boss says I should tell you that she is not there. What I'm saying is that the very principles that Christ stood for, those are the things that we must see reflecting in our lives. When people look at you, will they see Christ in you? So when I worked, I have worked in procurement before, and if you have worked in procurement before, it's, it's, it can be very tempting. It can be very tempting because then you have, have some willpower to 
to, to decide where things should go. Even today, cram young, so you can even remember those days. <laughs> so one guy comes and says, oh, um, if, you can, if you can get me this deal, I'm prepared to pay you 10% like now. If I, get, if I get assurance from you, I'll give you 10% now. You know, now, if you give me the commitment that this contract will come to me, I'll give you 10%. Then when everything is also done, I'll also give you another 10% based on the contract. Sir. You know, and if you're a young man and Sally, you also want to live big and you want to ensure that you also enjoy a good life, then the chances are that you may try and disqualify even those that qualify, um, skew the thing towards this person and ensure that I mean, the person wins. I, t I told this man that ah, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. He says, ah, young man, you want to remain like this? I said, yes, I, I prefer this, you know. Because he, he thought that that would be, I mean, a good opportunity for me to, at least to probably maybe enrich myself or gather some wealth. But I'm saying that you must live a lifestyle that will be pleasing unto God. Again, still even within this procurement business, there was one day I got a call. Then, this one is, is coming from a minister. He says, um, am I speaking to Kisi? I said, yes. Okay, um, so, um, there's one of my boys. He has put in a bid for this, um, this, um, this procurement activity. And please work hard to get him the contract. I said, <laughs> And I this one is 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 is, is tough. So, so oh, you do your possible best because this guy has been um, supporting my campaign, you know, and he's put in a lot. So when he came to me, I cannot, you know, and it is tough. If you are not too careful, you would you would compromise, you would compromise, and you would give in, you would give in. So I said, okay, well. Um, we are we are now going to evaluate the the tender bit the tender that we have received and it's a committee so whatever comes out will do well to let you know eventually he did not get it but I'm saying that in our day to day activities I mean people will bring all sort of things that would that would create a dent you know that would create a dent and you would lose your respect. Your life must be able to impact others. So that sometimes even when some issues are being discussed, just because of you being around, people will even shy away from talking about it. When people want to do something, just because you are there, our lifestyles must minister to people. Our lifestyles must minister to people. So Titus chapter 3, the verse 8 and 14 says, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Then the verse 14 says that our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. So the second thing is that our lives must impact others. Then the third and final is that we must, we must say with love. About two days ago we were talking about um, loving like Jesus or love like Jesus. And ministering to people, touching people, must be holistic. It must not be a one-sided approach. So you would notice that Jesus, even before he would minister to people, would, would seek their interest. He would want to feed them. Once they are fed, they are prepared to receive the word. And we must be able to touch people as well. So we must engage in acts of kindness, compassion, and service. And we must also desire to meet the practical needs 
and also demonstrate God's love in intangible ways. You know? So when we begin to do these things, it begins to draw people to the God that we serve. This one, I heard it from my, my former boss, the clerk of the General Assembly, Papa Etienne Jean Paul, who mentioned that some years ago, a gentleman applied for scholarship to the Presbyterian Church of Ghana. He applied for scholarship. He wanted to go and study medicine. But this person was a Muslim. This person was a Muslim. We are talking about serving with love, uh, demonstrating God's love in tangible ways. And for many institutions, for the fact that the gentleman is a Muslim, would just throw it somewhere. Because then the question is, ah, now, a Christophobia brian, as a praise be a Christophobia brian, in fear, you know, we have not given them attention. So why must we attend to the needs of this person? This is a practicing Muslim, you know, not an academic, a practicing Muslim. So, but the church decided that what they would support him. So right from year one to year six, the church sponsored his education. When he completed, and he came back to thank the church for the support offered him, he remarked that he's, he's shocked, you know, uh, that they started and they ended. The, the church was very consistent. And if there is a church, like the PCG, even though he was a Muslim and he wasn't a Christian, but they were prepared to sponsor his education through and through for him to become who he was at that time. Then he would want to renounce his faith and join the church. So this is somebody that moved from his faith because of the kind of love that was expressed to him. He made a U-turn and came to the PCG. When you hear of Latter-day Saints, Latter-day Saints gathered numbers in Ghana because of um, the 83 um, famine, you know, when they brought uh, maize from the U.S. and they started feeding people. You go there, you will get some, some, some food items. And that is how they got numbers. Other than that, they wouldn't have gotten numbers. But they were able to make impact in the community because they demonstrated, I mean, tangible, they demonstrated, or well, maybe we say God's love in tangible ways, or they tried to, 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 to help people. They tried to help people in a, more, in a more practical way. They tried to help people in a more practical way. So, you are hungry, I go here, I would get food, then I would want to remain here. If we really want to touch people, then let us desire that we would serve the needs of others in a more practical way. May the Lord bless us and grant us the grace to be the salt of this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray and say thank you to God. Bless the name of God. Thank God for giving us a purpose as a salt in the world. Thank God that he's given us a purpose as a salt in the world to bring flavor and preserve goodness. The text said that if a salt loses its saltiness, it becomes useless. 
It has no value. It has no use. Pray that the Lord will protect you from the corruption of the world. Fortifying our hearts with the purity of God's truth and righteousness. Pray that the Lord will protect you from the corruption of the world. We can be corrupted in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities, where we do our businesses. We can be corrupted by the things of this world. Pray and ask God, the Lord help me, protect me from the corruption of the world. Fortify my heart with the purity of your truth and righteousness. We don't want to lose our saltiness. When we lose our saltiness, we become useless. We are of no value to this world. You don't want to lose that saltiness in you. And so your prayer is, Lord, protect me from corruption. Continue to pray in the name of Jesus and ask the Lord to strengthen you to stand firm and to be able to hold on to your Christian values. Pray that the Lord will strengthen us to stand firm in our values and convictions. Preserving integrity in a world often tainted by compromise. Charles Spurgeon once said, The Bible is not the light of the world. It is the light of the church. But the world does not read the Bible. The world reads Christians. The Bible is not the light of the world. It is the light of the church. But the world does not read the Bible. The world reads Christians. This is coming from Charles Spurgeon. We want to pray that we will radiate Christ. We will live a lifestyle that pleases God. We will live a lifestyle that pleases God. Christ becomes the standard. That people will see Christ in all that we do. The manner in which we talk we interact with people. We carry out our activities. It 
must reflect that of Christ. I want you to pray for that member, that loved one, that cherished person in your home, in your community, in your workplace, in your church, that person that you know has departed from the path of God that leads to eternal life. We know them. For some of us, our spouses haven't given their lives to Christ. For some of us, we know our children have not given their lives to Christ. For some of us, we have friends. We have business partners. That haven't given their lives to Christ. Let us say a prayer for them. But Father, this person that is close to me, this person that I know, this person that I work with, Pray that the Lord will visit such people. Pray that the Lord himself will arrest such people. The Lord will draw such people closer to himself. May they give up on their evil deeds. May they give up on their evil deeds and may they surrender their lives to Christ. Say a prayer for that sister. Say a prayer for that mother. Say a prayer for that brother. Say a prayer for that friend. That the Lord would deliver him or her. Continue to pray that the Lord will open your heart to the pain and suffering of others. We have talked about offering tangible help to people. Pray that the Lord will open your heart to the pain and suffering of others and that the Lord should lead us to respond with empathy, compassion, and practical help. That help you may provide to that person may draw the person closer to God. You know, we talked about the fact that salt brings healing and restoration. It suits our wounds. And when we provide practical help to people, we suit their wounds. And we bring comfort to them. That the Lord will open our hearts to the pains and sufferings of others. And he should lead us to respond with empathy, compassion, and practical help. Our last but one prayer, let us continue to pray for our members. We are talking about the Accra Ridge Church. And all those that are connected to this church, say a prayer for our members. Those that have issues, those, have, those that have challenges, pray for those that are sick or well. Pray for those that are seeking their rightful partners. Those that are seeking for promotion. Those whose promotions have been delayed. Pray that the Lord will help them. Pray for those that are seeking to change jobs. Pray for those that are seeking high-paying jobs. Pray for those that are expecting to see their better halves. Pray that the Lord will connect them. Let us say a prayer for our members. Those that have academic challenges, pray that the Lord will help them. And let us ask God for his divine protection. That the Lord will protect our members. So it says that as the mountains around Jerusalem, so will he watch over us. And lastly, I want you to pray and bring your heart, desire, or desires before God. Talk to God about that heart desire. Pray and ask God to come through for you. Bible says that the expectation of the righteous will not be cut short. 
pray that the Lord would meet you at the very point of your need. He says that I would give you the desire of your heart and I would make all your plans succeed. Bring that heart desire before God. He says that he will cause your life to shine more brighter than the sunshine at noonday. May that be your portion. Bible says that for every house is built by someone. But God is the builder of all things. He builds every aspect of our lives. Talk to him. To build your life for you. Pray that the beauty of our Lord would be upon us. The beauty of our Lord. May the Lord decorate us with his beauty. That which causes you to weep in your closet. That which causes you sometimes even to doubt the existence of God. I want you to bring that issue, that problem before God. And let us wrap up by thanking God. Say thank you to God. Father, we thank you for this afternoon also for coming to bless us through our song ministrations, through the word ministration, through the prayers that we have said. We seal every prayer with the blood of Jesus. And our prayer is, our Father, watch over your word to perform in our lives. Grant us the grace and the strength and the wisdom to be the salt the earth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we thank you so much for the way you presented it, that truth for us. It sounds so simple, but we never know exactly how to play our role as salt. I personally wonder why the lock up biscuits, jars, toffee jars on the key but they, they leave the salt open and uh, nobody has any fear that the salt will get finished or misused. So thank you so much for the explanation that the salt has a big role to play. I will eat, wonder also whether if you salt, you keep on salting or so forth, does the saltiness reduce? I'm just wondering if it's diluted. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. So, with much ado, uh, without much ado, let's uh, go to offertory period now. The ladies will give us music.
Father, I want to thank you so much for what you have opened our eyes unto this afternoon. We pray for grace to live as really the salt of this earth and to make the right impact and draw men, O oh Lord, into your kingdom. We also are praying that even this offering that we have brought to you, Lord, we bless it so that these who are also be able to draw others into your kingdom. May you continue to bless us, preserve us from all that is evil, and call the light of our countenance to lighten our way as we go through the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we sing the national anthem, please? Normally on Wednesdays we sing the national anthem. To share the grace. The announcement is that there's an abuse right in person or online. Hallelujah. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Um, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. God bless you for coming. Have a blessed afternoon.